plain and simple. How do we actually plan a research experiment? How do we go into a lab or our area of research and plan a research experiment? Today, I'll be talking to you about a little five-step process I use to plan all of my experiments I've done since undergrad all the way to a postdoc. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. This one is all about the rationale. You have to first sit down and understand why do we want to do this experiment? How does it fit into our current research plan, our PhD? How does it fit into the wider remit of this area of research? What's the point of it? What is the purpose? These are the questions we need to ask first of all before we decide on how to do any form of experiment. Now it sounds quite obvious, but a lot of the time we do it because we think there's a gap in the knowledge. But once we've sat down and decided, we realize that the purpose isn't actually valid or the need isn't actually that important. So we need to concrete understand, right, is this useful? Is this worth it? Is it contributing something beneficial that we can then look into further? If not, then maybe it's not an experiment that we actually need to do. And this is quite, quite important because so much time, and you'll see it throughout this video, we spend a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of expenses to an experiment that actually might not be that useful. So keep in mind, purpose is very important. Let's move now on to number two. This is all about evidence in literature. Now, there are some very niche exceptions where what you're doing is incredibly novel that you might not find much backing in the literature, but nine times out of 10, you will find some sort of relation to what you're doing. It may not be exactly the same, but the principle might be similar or the methods might be similar somewhere else. You might be looking at a particular type of cell or drug or analysis and somebody else has done something similar. So you want some evidence that this is of importance because if you said that, okay, we feel X, Y, and Z is really important, you need some backing, you need some statements, you need some evidence to corroborate and back up your claim. And then that can justify why you're doing an experiment, either why you're applying for funding, why you're doing in your PhD, whatever reason you're doing it for, you need some evidence in the literature. Now this might be to confirm that there is a gap in this area. So you might find so many papers looking at this area and you see that not many people are looking at this or that, that can justify your finding. You may also look at it as a reverse, that there is a lot of evidence into this particular type of research, but there is scope to take it one step further if somebody hasn't done so. So whether it's a gap, or a advancement in the current understanding. You need some evidence within literature. And there's many forms. Um, I've mentioned in my Instagram post over here, how to find important literature, how to find something useful to back up your claim. But bear this in mind before we even plan the methods, is the evidence in literature to your rationale and to your why of doing the experiment. But what about number three? At the same time, we were looking at the evidence to back up our purpose, our why. You can also use that literature to back up the protocols that you need to do this type of research or to do this experiment. Now, whatever experiment it might be, it may be looking at va uh, facial expressions in a psychology study, or it might be growing a different type of cell line, or it might be testing a different type of drug. Whatever it is, there will be some basis, some template protocol that you need to back up in order then to refine and optimize your protocol. Because no matter where we look, we have to actually find how do we do this experiment in the first place. We've now justified the why, we've justified it in the literature. Now it's like, okay, how do we actually do it? And where can we find authentic, genuine sources on how to do this experiment? Especially from the foundation level, the basis level. And that's where these cited protocols come in. So where we look at literature, look at the methods that these people have used, we look into the references and then find, okay, where is the source or how many people have referenced this particular method, and then we go out and try it. But the really important thing is that whatever experiment you do, make sure there is protocol within your research group or actually in literature that you can say, right, we can actually do this experiment now, we can trial out this method, we can trial out this protocol, and then we can maybe get closer and closer to the experiment that we want to do. You will have to start from somewhere. And cited protocols is a very, very important way to do so. But then the question is, What's number four all about? This is actually my favorite. 99% of all research and all experiments are governed by these two things, cost and time. So you have to factor this now into your experimental design and how you're gonna plan your research experiment. We understand the why, we justify the why, we now have some kind of foundational understanding on how to do it in forms of decided protocol. 
now we have to refine it based on our area. So our research group, our funding capabilities, our resources, our time. Now the protocol might say to do X, Y, and Z, but you, not be, you may not be able to afford it, or you may not have the right machinery or right equipment or right software. So now we take these cited protocols, we take these templates, and then what we actually do is refine it so it suits our possibility of doing that within our lab or within our research area. And that is obviously governed by cost and time. Now you have to factor in, can you use a substitute or can you do it a different way? You may not be able to spend hours and hours, so can you do it a quicker way or can you not do it that way because you don't have the resources to do it that optimized way? Is there another way to do it? So we have to now factor these in to then figure out and then design our actual research experiment that's designed for our lab or our research area. Cost and time, incredibly important. And the last but not least is number five, something we don't like. That is all about identifying obstacles that may hinder our research experiment. So that's now looking into our research area or the lab that we're working in or the software or the computer that we're using and figure out are there hindrances that might make it unfeasible to do this research experiment. So it might be the computing power if you're doing bioinformatics. You don't have the software particularly needed to do this and it may be lagging or it may be you know stagnating. If you're in the lab, it may be that the machine that you need to use or equipment that you need to use is way too busy and you have to find maybe a different way to design experiment so you have to minimize time using that particular equipment. Or it might be that the cell line that you need is very hard to come by and it's been you know slightly unstable within the lab there's been a lot of infections so the, the cell line you need to do your experiment may not be as safe as what you need it to be so unfortunately you have to maybe rework your experiment and that's why it's really important before you go out to do something check within your area within your working research area are there things are there people are there certain situations that might lead to hindrances within your lab work and within your experimental design if so factor that in so you can have a more smoother more efficient and more effective lab protocol experimental design whichever way you want to look at it so guys that was my five step process on how to plan any research experiment no matter which research area you're in if you did find it useful do consider giving it a like on the video it will help the channel to grow and help this video to help many more researchers so i'll be very very thankful for that and if you did enjoy this style of video do consider subscribing if you wanted to and click that notification bell so you are notified when we upload and when i mean we it's just me there isn't anybody else the channel is small unfortunately and if you wanted to see other kind of content, Instagram pages over here and my actual newsletter, my weekly newsletter, the link is in the video description down below. Just because I just don't want you to miss anything. That's all. I just don't want you to miss all of these research tips and advice for their research life. But in any case, I shall hopefully see you in the next one. Hope you have a good week and I'll see you soon.